they're shelving cannabis infused beverages in liquor stores. They're not putting the two together, but they're putting them in the same ecosystem. And they are really, really selling quite well. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Dime. I'm Brian Fields, and with me, as always, is Kellen Finney. And this week, we got a very special guest, Paul Weaver, head of cannabis at the Boston Beer Company. Paul, thanks for taking the time. How are you doing today? Brian, Kellen, nice to, nice to see you again. Thanks for having me. You're in New York, right, Brian? And then, Kellen, you're in Colorado, and I'm in Toronto. Ooh. So we got the, tri- the new triangle of, of, of pot That's between right. the three of us. But we might have to ask you on the record from a location, but I'll let Kellen set that up. Kellen, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Really excited to talk to Paul. I mean, really cool what Boston Beer's doing. Really cool what what they've kind of done with this cannabis beverage. Excited to learn more about it. You know, really excited to talk to Paul though, because I think we have a, a a West Coast history that we share in terms of our loyalty. But I'll let Paul really say where his true loyalty lies in I, terms of just, East Coast or West Coast. <laughs> yeah, I think just to clarify correctly, Paul, that the name of your company is what. <laughs> <laughs> Just to- yeah, I mean, no one here has a Boston connection, which is funny, yeah. Okay, so Boston Beer Company is best known in America, though, for as Sam Adams, Twisted Tea, uh, and, and Orchard Cider, and Truly Hard Seltzer. Those are kind of our four big hits uh, from the beverage alcohol space. But two years ago, we set up an R&D division based in Canada, where cannabis is unequivocally legal, to prepare for a U.S. market entry. So We created a product line called Teapot, which is a line of cannabis iced teas. And we've been selling that pretty well here in Canada. We're the number one cannabis tea in the country and then edible in the province of Quebec. Uh, And we're really kind of prepping and continue to prep as the U.S. shenanigans towards legal weed is always, always something new. So we're, we're excited. We're excited what we're building in Canada and we're excited to one day bring it down south. I guess just to kind of kick it off, you are the head of the cannabis at a big alcohol company. How... How is it received amongst the cannabis industry? Are you looked at as an ally or are you looked at as pretty much enemy number one? <laughs> well, I don't know what people say behind our backs. So perhaps <laughs> after I, I come off, you guys just start shit talking me and our global ambitions. But no, I think like one, I think representing kind of craft beer, representing high quality drinks, there is a, a difference Boston beer brings to a conversation than other beer companies. So I don't think all beer companies are the same, but our team, our staff, how we've built out our, our team is a lot of experienced cannabis pros. You know, I worked at Canopy Growth Corporation for a number of years as their director of innovation. We have people who've worked for cannabis extraction companies and we were really funded and owned by a, a beer company. Our pedigree is pretty hardcore cannabis. And I think that just allows just a, a sense of self-awareness. So we're well aware of perceptions towards us and and how alcohol could be viewed. And we just try and be self-aware when we talk about our parent company and how, what we bring to the space. But no, I would say generally people are pretty up, up for what we're doing and they like what our brand stands for. And so far, so good. I think the, the most important aspect is that it's the first kind of foray into the market from like a, a big standpoint, right? Like not everyone comes in and announces their presence, but your team has a division. And I'd like you to talk about kind of your role there specifically and, and how it kind of works to not only help kind of knock down the barrier for beverages, but help bring kind of the innovation from cannabis to a big alcohol company. Yeah, I mean, there's things that work on both sides. So, you know, we have the benefit of a lot of resources of product development, liquid development, packaging, even just like supply chain and installing new equipment. We have a lot of resources that we can bring to being more efficient and more polished in terms of what, what we can do in the cannabis space, just based on you know 40 years of, of highly refined process. And it's kind of cool to see how we've we brought in a little bit of stuff to, uh, to the Boston beer side. So one of the first things we did was amend our company's drug and alcohol policy to be mindful of cannabis use, you know, like no longer mandatory testing for cannabis consumption and recognizing signs of impairment, acknowledging that we're now through Canada, also a cannabis company. And I think just kind of introducing the boring paperwork parts of, of it all, you know, like we've been welcomed with open arms in terms of our company and we're able to bring a lot of what they do to the cannabis side. Is that a leadership move? Is that somebody at the top of the organization that is interested in doing that? Or is that more of an internal champion that's pushing that up to the top and saying, hey, <laughs> I think this is something that we need to expand our organization with? To get into cannabis just generally? Correct. Yeah, it's top down. Like one of the nice things about our organization is we are still 
very founder centric. You know, Jim Cook, our founder 40 years ago, still is actively involved in our in our business and our commercial decisions. And uh, you know, the chain of command in terms of who I reached out to was our CEO, Dave Berwick, the Boston Beer Head of Innovation, Robert Vale, our founder, Jim Cook. And those are the first three people that I spoke with here. So I think it starts at the top. And uh, in, in our case, the company really the center in terms of the acceptance of and willingness to explore cannabis. So you spent some time at, at Molson Coors before Canopy, right? And then yeah. you, you transitioned over to your current role. And so during that kind of timeline, when did you like start to really believe that, that cannabis could be ingested in a beverage? Like, was there a certain inception point or did you kind of just watch the market kind of mature over those last seven years, if you will? That's a great question. You know, I didn't really think about it. It's funny coming from beer into cannabis. I didn't really think about anything other than just base flower because I, I was a medical cannabis patient and um, it was really finding that added a lot of value to my life. And that was what energy I brought it when I joined Canopy Growth. But Canopy did have aspirations of beverages and was really starting to explore the idea. And I met a lot of the R&D team at, at Canopy that had created their own emulsion tech and was figuring out ways of making a, a beverage out of cannabis. And that really blew my mind, just the idea of a, a true alternative to alcohol that has virtually no calories, you know, a, a really easy to manipulate liquid format. You can make it taste like anything and uh, it gets you high versus buzz, but it's still a, a great experience. Like I didn't really understand the idea until I had a chance to be a part of R&D making them. And yeah, I was hooked, man. Like this, it seemed like the future and a chance to actually be a part of the future. What was the the first idea or the first kind of inception that made you hook? Was it an experience tasting it or something that you saw? What made you hook? You know, when uh, Canopy Growth was founded by a guy named Bruce Lind, who's kind of a, an infamous character now in, in cannabis because he he built such a, a beautiful company and then saw that company get a lot of overinvestment. And, you know, so but Bruce uh, is someone who I, I really do admire and, the, and I do view as a visionary. And when I first saw Bruce speak, he had this just this visual of a almost looked like a vodka bottle, but it said hi, which is H I period on it. And it was really meant to be more of a rhetorical visual, just make you think. And it was just the, the concept, just the visual of it, just seeing how it would look in an ideal, beautiful package and knowing what was inside that bottle was very intriguing to me. And then the first time you try a cannabis beverage with a fast onset and uh, you're in a group of people that are all really enjoying the experience. It's pretty fun also. So R&D and be cannabis beverages is pretty fun and that can make you a believer too. But just seeing it, just seeing the idea fully realized was enough to make me a believer. I, I think you hit the nail on the head perfectly. And I still like have that visual when I handed my friends the first time a beverage and said to them, like, try this. And their first thought was, will this get me high? And it's just incredible that we're at this early stage where Everyone just assumes, or at least a lot of people currently assume that there's no other alternatives except for kind of consuming like with smoking flowers, but the beverage, which is such a big bridge to what the potential could be from a future for widening the total adjustable market of cannabis consumers. Well, the fun thing is like, it's this interesting Venn diagram. And I think weed drinks kind of sit right in the middle. One, one is the experienced cannabis consumer. I suggest perhaps two people like you guys uh, that are doing just fine with their form factors of weed and I love all form factors of weed, but maybe they have something that they're tried and true. And maybe we should all be smoking less. So just like a nice little reminder that we should be smoking a little less. That's one circle. And then the other circle being, you know, a traditional alcohol drinker that probably should be drinking less alcohol. So it's this like just the overlap between these two, you know, very loyal, very passionate everyday people that probably should smoke less weed and or should let drink less alcohol. And we can, maybe we can offer something that can satisfy both. It's uh, funny that that's coming from uh, an alcohol company, you know? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the secret's out. You know, I think like there's some crazy stuff about how, you know, did you I see this report from Cowan Research a couple of weeks ago, a week ago, that said that in the next two years, they expect 18 million more American cannabis consumers and 2 million less alcohol consumers. I did see that actually. It's like that's, like that's just the future. Like you just have to be honest with yourself and prepare for the new reality of how adults are choosing to let off some steam. So you guys are now decided to be a part of that future. What made you choose teas over every other yeah. kind of like liquid you could mix with THC? Well, first I think we always lead with what we can 
make taste awesome. And um, teapot, I believe, I'm totally biased, but I believe teapot's the best tasting cannabis drink I've ever had. And, and I think that's a reflection of tea as a flavor it works actually really well with cannabis. It's it, the tannin profile of tea works really well with the taste of cannabis. So it's a natural fit taste wise. But our experience for 20 years making and refining twisted tea, no one makes a hard tea like we do. I've, I've tried at previous companies and I can tell you, uh, no one makes a, 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 an alcoholic tea or an adult tea like like uh like Boston beer and a lot that has to do with no carbonation, um, really well-balanced tea versus lemon flavor. And just like, so I think just, we knew we could make a great tasting drink, but there's this fun thing with teapot about different times of day. The idea of the right tea paired with the right pot for the right occasion. So we have a lemon black tea. It's a daytime tea. It's caffeinated. It hasn't, we use a sativa strain for the input, but we also have a blueberry chamomile evening iced tea that has no caffeine, that has uh, an indica strain infused with it that's meant to kind of replace your glass of wine at night. It's got 35 calories instead of 100 calories and a fraction of the sugar. So the cool thing about teapot is it's not just a twisted tea knockoff. It it has a lot more nuance to it. And we can go uppity daytime teas and relaxing sleepy time teas and and everything in the middle. What are the milligrams and how many years is one supposed to drink? Yeah, I mean, teapot, we designed teapot, our aspiration is to be like the least intimidating cannabis brand in the world. Like it has a fun name. It's kind of like a dad joke. It's got uh, exciting packaging. It doesn't taste or smell like weed. It just tastes like a great tasting iced tea. And the potency is pretty manageable. It's five milligrams of THC, which for a Colorado drinker, Cal, and I know that doesn't move anyone's needle, but for our drinker, you know, one, two, that's enough to have a great day. And and that's all we're hoping for is to just kind of enter the rotation and introduce an alternative to your, you know, to your daily drink. And five milligrams is a good amount to being commercially viable. It's not too low that it won't move on shelf, but it's not too strong where our new drinker will get kind of freaked out or, or have a bad experience. What was the rollout like? Because like I'm thinking most retail rocky, dispensaries, man, very rocky. <laughs> they don't have like fridges, right? So like there's like this whole new infrastructure, like how are you guys distributing it? Like that sounds like a, a, a challenge in and of itself as well. Well, this is where sometimes we do our, we do remind ourselves that we are an R and D department, you know, like we are at our core, we're here to learn and we're here to execute different ideas and prepare for a different model in, the, in America. But winning the dispensary grind is just grassroots, man. You just got to knock on doors. You have to be present. You've got to be prepared to answer all sorts of questions and just be a friend and ally to the butt tender. And that's really the root of our commercial rollout was just really trying to understand how bud tenders would think about teapot, how they would recommend teapot, knowing that the fridge space is minimal. Um, you know, we have a good head start in terms of distribution, but really it's the rollout is all about bud tender engagement and trying to find a way to, you know, introduce ourselves in the best, best foot forward. Your team has this luxury asset of having a built, established brand, not only with the infrastructure standpoint, but also with the trust with the consumers. Was that kind of the intention when you were rolling out Teapot was understanding that our consumers right now, they do not consume cannabis, but in the future, we'd like to transition them over. And we think this kind of middle grand product is the perfect one for that origin product um, for the Beaving flagship. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that the nice thing is Teapot has a five second selling story for most people, which is... Oh, well, are you familiar with Twisted Tea? Okay, well, they also make teapot. Like that ends up being the five-second selling story for most uh, you know, busy dispensaries, and it makes it nice and tight. We don't directly associate ourselves with Twisted Tea because we're a different brand. We're not alcohol. We're not just trying to be an extension of alcohol, and we're not necessarily the same drinker, but we certainly can learn from our successes and how to talk about a brand and how to, how to you know, throw a good party. Like Twisted Tea is the number 10 beer in America now. Like Number 10. And that's a result of this grassroots word of mouth and just really just playing the long game. So I do think we could actually be doing more in terms of bringing those two worlds together and really trying to be like the Robin to their Batman. But I think, you know, we got plenty of time to figure out the right way to do it. Are there challenges internally as in developing these products that maybe have surprised you along the way where you had an origin or an idea one night and you're like, hey, I'm going to try to bring this in and then just kind of stumbled throughout the process, just given the complexity of cannabis or, or something else? Oh, God, yeah. You know, I'm thinking more of our time at, at Canopy Growth, where we were operating 
pre-legalization and really a lot of market readiness and a lot of great ideas that were just too many good ideas and it you know kind of crumble out of the weight of too much innovation to try and roll out at any given time. But you know honestly the the reality is and this is this is kind of a universal truth for product development is always build buffer for your first production runs. Like you never know what you don't know until you do it. And um, whether that's the need for an extra step in pasteurization, whether that's different labels that will apply differently to a can, whether that's the childproof cap, you know, that that works a little differently than you anticipated. Every every time you make a new drink, there's always something that you didn't anticipate and giving yourself enough buffer to course correct and still hit your, your launch timelines. So you know, for us, uh, one of the earlier things was pasteurization. You know, we just really needed, like making teapots really hard. Making teapot with a decent shelf life requires just a few extra steps of product development. So, you know, those lesson learned, we wouldn't have known unless we had to do it the first time. So, yeah. Do you, go, do you guys get to utilize the same manufacturing equipment that Twisted Tea uses? We we can use a lot of the same stuff in terms right, of... Right, but it's just type of equipment. in a different building like, kind of thing. In the closet. Yeah, we can't co-mingle co- manufacturing, which is, a, which is a big bummer because, it you know... ROI that, would be sick. <laughs> that, beverage, beverage manufacturing is very expensive and very capital intensive. And if someone has already bit the bullet on a tanks or a canning line or uh, secondary packaging, might as well just slide in. But no, we, we have to produce teapot in a legally designated cannabis processing facility. So there's only a few. We actually, we our facilities in Windsor, Ontario, which is right across the river from Detroit. And um, that's where we make teapot, but it, we, the, we only make teapot there. We don't make anything else. Are there any cannabis related challenges that have surprised people internally at the Boston Beer Company? Something that just has completely shocked them that there were some cannabis kind of clamps? You know, <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to think of what are some of the more salient ones. You know, one of the things that I think really funny, it's in, I think you'll appreciate this, is beverage alcohol companies are blessed with data. So much data. And every business decision they make has four different points of of retailer, consumer insights data for them to validate. And there's just not a lot of concrete data in cannabis, whether it's sales or brand awareness or brand health or tracking. And so you do have to kind of infer a lot. You've got to cobble together different types of data sources. You've got to do a lot of different digging to get objective results. So I think like data and a data availability is the one that probably surprised the most amount of people. And then also just how good it can taste. I think most surprises people because alcohol inherently has this taste that you have to mask or complement. But a cannabis drink doesn't really have much taste. So I would say that on the downside, we surprise a lot of people on how lack of data uh, exists and how we kind of, we work in this ambiguous data world. But I think we pleasantly surprise a lot of people with uh, just how good a cannabis beverage can taste when it's done correctly. You think that opens up the eyes for what is possible internally? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you guys have all the infrastructure to utilize the data to make decisions on the beer side. You have all of the the teams that are used to kind of dealing with all of these different chemical profiles and hops and and other uh, medias. Do you get to use those same people on the cannabis side of things as well? Can you commingle the the human knowledge at least? Yeah, I mean, we 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 set a certain uh, allocation of time to ensure that we're kind of within the bounds of legality you know like we are we have dedicated cannabis workers up here that do r d and then when appropriate we can tap into some existing u.s intelligence and product development experience within within reason so there's just kind of a fraction of their time that they can dedicate to cannabis but yes absolutely and i'd say some of the areas that are most helpful are in like brewing and engineering and like tanks and pipes and (laughs) pasteurizing equipment like the stuff that like you know there's People that have been making breweries and building breweries for 20 years, and those people know what they're doing. And it doesn't matter if they're moving THC liquid or alcohol or soft drinks, you know, gaskets or gaskets and pipes or pipes. And so just getting engineering experience has been a godsend. What about other big alcohol companies? What is their perspective on cannabis and what Boston Beer Company is doing? Are they deploying resources? And if they are, is it more in a hidden sense from an R&D standpoint? Because what your team doing is like pushing innovation forward. And at a certain point, your team is going to be way out in front. It's going to be a matter of catching up. Is Have you been hearing anything? Are people sharing stuff or is it more of kind of a private conversation? 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of observation, a lot of research, and there's a lot of concept work in alcohol companies. Ideating is another word they would say, like, what might it look like if we were to do something in that space? So a lot of that happens, and but it's very like, you don't learn a lot, you just kind of make pretty pictures. There's a few of us that are doing beer and cannabis, you know, Lagunitas in California is a great example, PAPS is a great example. But for the most part, no, you have a few beverage alcohol companies that maybe got a bit impulsive and over-invested in, uh, in cannabis companies, which may have soured some of our, our peers in terms of over-investing or how to invest. I'm really proud of how we've set up our business model for Boston Beer Cannabis. Like we do not have owned infrastructure. We're very asset light. Everything we do is more about brand development, liquid development, intellectual property, not over-investing in one business model or one go-to-market route or one manufacturing solution. So we're pretty nimble and pretty asset light, which makes us different than kind of our peers in space. What about any future combinations of alcohol and let's say CBD? I haven't seen too much of that. I know California banned that a while ago. And I think that did set up kind of a, a taboo product development story between buying the two. And in Canada, it is unequivocally illegal to put your cannabinoids in an alcohol. So you can do like 0.5%. That's basically the most you can do. So no, I have, we really don't consider commingling the two. Like we have a very clear non-alcoholic cannabis beverage uh, product development journey and uh, a very clear alcohol beverage community. So no, we keep the two separate. Do you think in the future that they will be mixed together? Do you think that that'll be an option? Not THC. Why? I think that there's, you know. Inherent health safety risks? Well, aside from like, just, the, I think that the four loco situation in a re- real talk, right? No, real talk. I, I, hey, I, I, I participated yeah. in that once. <laughs> yeah. No, I think four, I think four loco, which was kind of completely unrestricted commingling of two active ingredients of alcohol and caffeine, like that didn't go very well. So I just can't see a scenario where regulators are going to allow meaningful amounts of two psychoactive ingredients, alcohol being one and cannabis being the other. CBD, maybe, you know, because you have, in theory, dual intoxicants. But, you know, I think I think Four loco kind of ruined the party mixers. <laughs> I can only imagine regulators... I only drank Four str- loco once. Yeah, okay. Thanks for the record, Kellen. Uh, I can only imagine regulators would struggle enough with the idea and the concept of, of mixing those two together that I think it's it's likely not happening. Um, if I had Well, guess. but where... Are you guys following this hemp Delta 9... Minnesota uh, explosion that's going on. Yes. You want right. to give some context for our listeners that might not be familiar? Yeah. Okay. So through uh, the current version of the 2018 farm bill, there's a, a lack of clarity, a very vague ambiguities around THC levels in hemp derived food and beverage products. And as a result, through some clever chemistry and some aggressive legal interpretation, you have found people creating hemp-derived THC beverages and edibles sold under the auspices of the farm bill as a hemp product. And that is creating a lot of disruption because a hemp product, in theory, is pretty unrestricted in terms of how you can sell that. So you're seeing these hemp-derived THC products sold not just in like California dispensaries. No, you're seeing them in like Texas liquor stores or like Florida convenience stores, like pretty odd pot states, places where weed is not imminently going to be legalized, still selling a lot of hemp derived THC products. And um, they are commingling, they're shelving cannabis infused beverages in liquor stores, They're not putting the two together, but they're putting them in the same ecosystem. And they are really, really selling quite well. And I think it's showing the potential for these products when they're in the periphery of the right buyer, right? Like a beverage alcohol consumer is probably not walking into a dispensary, but if the product's there, they're intrigued. And once you try a cannabis drink, it's pretty awesome. So I imagine it's hard to pull that back once the cat's out of the bag. I think that's so perfectly said. And I think the one aspect that really opens people's eyes is that I'm sure a lot of these people who are, let's say, converting over or having conversations with their doctors, we can call them boomers. The doctor's saying, hey, why don't you drink a little less booze? He's like, doc, like, what should I do? He's like, try a little cannabis. And then he walks into his liquor store like he normally does. And he sees the THC beverage. And he's like, I'm going to give this a try. And you're right. I think one time he has that experience, he recognizes, oh, my God, this tastes great. I get a nice little buzz. And what? It's a replacement product. This is beautiful. Yeah. And what you're seeing too is like the pricing is really high for those, right? Like the pricing is still like more than a craft beer. And so it's a really attractive business for these retailers that are doing it. Like they're making pretty good money off 
these high price products and the drinkers love them. And so it's just, it's really just a question of now of like, well, now that we've kind of done this fire drill of putting weed in liquor stores, like what, what do we do now? Like, are we going to pull that back uh, under the next farm bill? Or are we going to st- ban this state by state? Or are we going to embrace it and formalize it and put regulations in place? Like it's going to be fascinating the next 12 months, how this continues to grow. What do you think happens? I have no idea. Seriously, I have no idea. Because if you were to ask me like six months ago, I would have said, no way, man, no way. They're, they'll just ban it again. The farm next, the next farm bill will ban it and all these guys will have to retract. But I don't know. It's it's doing so well. It's kind of hard to deny the commercial upside. And these people are small business owners and these are people who would really love you know some incremental taxes and incremental profits. So I do think they're going to have to acknowledge the commercial success of these hemp D9 drinks and whatever they do, even if they, let's say they shut it off at the farm bill and then they turn it through a state level marijuana program. I don't know. But uh, again, there's money made. And when I think money tends to like, these ideas tend to follow the money. So we'll see, but success breeds success. So. And the genie's out of the bottle, right? Like if I went to the grocery store and bought my hemp delta nine beverage in minnesota right and i come back and it's not there i'm gonna be like what you know what i mean so i think that like at this point you know there's no going back personally that's what i think yeah but i do think that the spirit of the regulations i personally believe that it's a little reckless because the spirit of the farm bill i don't think envisioned this like it's not like this was the plan so to me, it's like, okay, well, I'd like to see a plan though, because I think there's a lot of risk in just continuing to like self-regulate and trust that retailers are going to act responsibly in terms of shelving these products and promoting safe consumption. Like there's just a lot of corners that have to be rounded on this whole thing. It's still a little, little rocky. It, it does bring up though, like a, a macro conversation in terms of like what the driving forces behind this are, because you had all these people that went out and grew high CBD hemp, they extracted it, they had a ton of CBD. I mean, you're talking companies sitting on warehouses of CBD isolate, they didn't know what to do with it. People started losing money, companies started going out of businesses or going out of business. Chemists came in and decided to convert it over to Delta 9. They found an avenue to generate money, right? So this whole like having hemp now is supported by the department of ag you can grow hemp on a massive massive industrial scale and you're able to make the delta 9 thc molecule from hemp significantly cheaper by just harvesting cbd and converting it over so it's going to be hard if regulatory mandates that same delta 9 thc molecule actually comes from from cannabis where that those industries have been stifled by like canopy regulations you can only grow so much you can only have so much more license or so many licenses so like from a, an, a pure economic standpoint, it's going to be really, really challenging to to not just see a lot of these form factors start to just come from hemp. Like, what are your thoughts on some of those macro headwinds that the industry is now facing? I mean, these are deep questions, Kevin, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I do think like farmers should farm. And I think that Amen. the reality is like, it's agriculture. I don't say this lightly because I love cannabis and I love craft cannabis. I like high-end bougie cannabis, but it's still a commodity at the end of the day. And I think that, you know, it's also a business and you just have to recognize that timing these, you know, regulatory changes is virtually impossible. And if someone's going to get burned no matter what. So I think the reality is like, I, I would love to see outdoor grows and farm belt communities growing cannabis, whether you call that hemp or or marijuana or whatever, and just allow the commodity to follow those things and then treat it as agriculture under a farm bill, both both sides of it. And the synthesis stuff, the synthetic stuff of going from CBD and then converting to THC, like it's I'm now speaking a bit outside of my depth in terms of the chemistry of it all. And that does spook some people in terms of residual chemicals and like processes. And I think we'd, we'd want to see clear regulations, safety driven regulations on the source of the THC, even if it's coming from hemp, uh, from synthetic means or not. So I think my yada yada answer to a big 
core question, like what to do with America's cannabis farmers <laughs> <laughs> is like, just embrace all like treat it like we do any cash crop, treat it like we do any piece of agriculture, which is a very difficult industry, whether you're growing soybeans or fucking hemp. And then the source of the cannabis, that's the need for regulations. If you want to go synthetic, I don't understand the science well enough to know how to do that in a way that makes everyone happy, but hope, but trust safety regulations to put be put in place. And respectfully to those farmers, Kellen, you should never bet the farm on a product that has as many up and downs challenges as this one does. Yeah, or don't or don't get high on your own supply, maybe or something. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I our approach is always to respect the plant and respect the farmers, and everything we do from a uh, product perspective always ties back to reverence to the farmers. We had our product development team in Humboldt County for a week long excursion in the woods just to kind of touch some pretty plants and be a part of the harvest and feel like they're part of the ecosystem of weed, even if we're really far down the supply chain. So yeah, I, I I don't want to speak lightly of the challenges of growing cannabis, just like the challenges of growing anything. Honestly, yeah, there's it's a hard hard biz. What about communicating internally, like what's going on in Minnesota to your team? Is that one that's like weird and kind of uncomfortable? Because I can only imagine speaking to like your legal and saying like, hey, this is what's happening. This yeah. is technically legal. What is that conversation like? I was in Minnesota. Uh, it's funny when you say it. You say it like Fargo. I was in Minnesota a month or two ago and took my own photos and saw it firsthand. So I think one, you have to see it to believe it. And I think hearing it is one thing, but actually seeing it is wild. It's wild. And um, so it's real. It's very real. And it's doing really well. So uh, we had a all hands actually team meeting like a month ago. And I spoke to that to our entire company about what's going on in Minnesota, why we're not there right now, and what we want to see. And I think the reality is kind of how I said it earlier, you know, there's a little bit of recklessness in terms of the interpretation of those regulations and the farm bill. It's not really the spirit of the farm bill, we don't think, uh, but there's still tremendous commercial upside and people that we do business with are now in alcohol or doing business in hemp Delta nine. So we're looking at it, we're monitoring it, but we still, it's still really ambiguous. And the chance, there is still that chance that the whole thing gets shut down. So trying to be a bit patient, you know, we're a 40 year old company. We built Twisted Tea over 20 years. Like we're not going anywhere. We can handle a little bit of clarity on terms of the regulations from a farm bill. Does this same kind of uh, synthetic D9, is that impacting the Canadian market? Do you guys see, is it even allowed? Can you guys like sell hemp derived cannabinoids in the cannabis industry? It's a great question. Cause we actually, um, I had to ask that question ourselves because we're launching our first hemp derived teapot, uh, CBD teapot this summer or next summer. And um, like, is that okay? like, can I do it with hemp or do I got to do it with cannabis? And the reality is it's kind of, we don't think of it as a source plant. We think of it as the end cannabinoid. Mm -hmm. So that's the reality. Like we don't have the, the confusion around, well, I got it from this. I got it from that. Cannabinoids are cannabinoids. And all cannabinoids are regulated under the Cannabis Act in Canada. So CBD, THC, CBG, CBN, THCA, all that stuff, even Delta-8 is regulated as cannabis sold through Canadian dispensaries that have different provincial models. So uh, it's very simple. The answer is it's all weed in Canada. <laughs> Dream cannabis beverage session, three people dead or alive. Oh, right. You said, I remember this question because you guys told me this in advance and I, I wrote my answers down and I forgot them. I know one of them was Carl Sagan. <laughs> That'd be sweet. That's sick. I feel like he'd find it very fascinating. And uh, I would just love to get hang out with that guy. Like Steve Nash, maybe Phoenix Suns. Steve Nash would probably be a pretty cool guy to hang out with and, and get high with. He's a Canadian and he's got some Arizona roots. So that'd be probably a fun guy to hang out with. In that mix, he'd have a, he'd have a good time. He's still alive. We'll get high <laughs> together. That'd be a pretty good, pretty good crew. I love seeing people think about that as like that last person, such a challenging one. You don't want to leave anybody out, but there's always someone there. You're like, I just got to put. Yeah, I think the right answer is your dad or your wife. I should have said my wife, but she, I don't think she wants me in that conversation. She would get too bored. <laughs> well, we, we won't tag her in the conversation. <laughs> what is one factor statistic operating in the, in the cannabis industry that would surprise or shock others to know? What fact or statistic would surprise people about cannabis? Uh you know, uh, I think I'm going to butcher this stat, so maybe I try and pull this up. 
But just like what the percentage of people are that actually are cannabis consumers and how much room there is to grow. Yeah, I just pulled it up. I'm so happy I did this. So um, in Canada, where we're generally considered like a pretty pro cannabis market, uh, actually only 27% of the population consumed cannabis last year. And I think that with, the longer you're in the industry, the more you kind of think everyone's a pothead. But the reality is, uh, no, it's actually like still a growing, like gen pop is still the source, the biggest source of growth, you know, and that's why drinks is so fascinating. It's like three quarters of the population doesn't consume weed. And so, and if they were, they probably weren't going to smoke a joint or hit your dab pen. So maybe a cannabis drink is the right scenario for that three quarters of unenlightened uh, future drinker. So how, how challenging is it then to actually forecast what the potential size of the cannabis beverage market could be, given the state-by-state -state hurdles, the expectation that the next generation is going to be a big consumers, plus unlocking that, exactly like you said, all those people right now that don't consume, because that number seems almost impossible to forecast because it just be so large. Well, I think part of that is also your business model, right? We don't own infrastructure. So in terms of building capacity and trying to like guess where the market will be in 10 years, like we don't have, we have the luxury of just allowing it to develop in front of us. We don't try and forecast against hypotheticals. You know, we just look at the current size of the category, put a growth and a modest growth projection against it. You know, like I think, you know, we're up a pretty decent chunk here in Canada. Uh, there's some nuance to that growth, but like most of us are up about 20 plus percent in, uh, in Canada. So like the, the growth is there in cannabis drinks just organically. And then we don't try and project new drinkers into the mix. We just try and stay flexible so that when there is you know a big lift or a big unexpected pop that we can just double down in production. But we, we part of it is us, you know, not needing to be too stressed about that because we don't have infrastructure that we built accordingly. We're, we're just a brand and just, a, just a recipe. Well said. I thought I thought about another stat though. My fa I mean, second favorite stat. Share it because you guys would dig this. Okay, so they were measuring pothead cities in Canada, and they did it by um, wastewater. So they actually pulled the wastewater streams and uh, Montreal, Nova, uh, Halifax, Toronto, Vancouver. They pulled the wastewater and tested it to see uh, the THC level in what was flushed down the toilet and. I think Montreal had the highest per capita THC content in the wastewater than any city in Canada. So I thought that was really funny that like, they actually don't sell a lot of legal weed in Montreal, it's still a pretty um, thriving black market, but they tested pretty hot in terms of their wastewater. <laughs> That's spectacular. Can you be, imagine being the one running that experiment? <laughs> There's a whole bunch <laughs> of them. That's, they, they were doing COVID testing that way, right? They were testing uh, COVID numbers. Yeah. If you could put anything on a billboard, metaphorically speaking, to get a message to billions of people, could be an image, a quote, or a word, or something that inspired you. What's the first thing that comes to mind? A bill to inspire people, or to like sell more teapot? <laughs> anything. Well, I should sell more teapots. So I probably would say something like, you know, on a billboard where you're talking broadcast. You know, I think just existential, right? Like, you know. A nice teapot logo that says the original chilled tea. That's our tagline. And a nice, beautiful product shot on a billboard with millions of viewers. Like, that's enough for me. I don't think we have to try and, like, get too inspirational or too rhetorical. I think I would just love to see a billboard for our product, just like you do alcohol. You know, there's a in Toronto, there's a, a highway called the Gardner Expressway. And there's a big, like, water tower-sized beverage can that's up for grabs for any advertiser that wants to pay for that for that. So every year it's wrapped with some years it's Budweiser, sometimes it's Coors Light, sometimes it's, um, uh, you know, Moosehead or something. And, you know, to just get something like that, a cannabis product with that level of above the line awareness, that's enough for me. Love it. All right. Prediction time. Paul, do you anticipate a transformative collaboration between big alcohol companies and the cannabis sector? If yes, how visible do you think the ship will be in the next few years? The thing is, is that like most big alcohol companies probably will just wait until they just acquire somebody outright. I don't think there's a lot of companies like us that are patient brand builders that are really trying to build their own culture in the space and try and build their own credibility. Um, so yes and no, I think there will be strategic investments in cannabis companies by alcohol. You're already seeing it pick up on pharma and tobacco over the last like year. So yeah, I think there will be, but I don't think it's going to be as uh, fun and 
uh, collaborative and um, crafty is what we're doing. Well said. Kellen? I think that you're going to see more of under the radar kind of approach from a lot of the big alcohol companies, especially in America right now, with it being federally legal, illegal, right? I think that what's really going to happen is that, like you said, they're either going to purchase a brand that's already been successful and not have to build out any of the infrastructure. But realistically, I think they're just going to kind of try to build something separate and just isolate it and just be able to to, to capture that revenue. But I don't think they're, you're going to see anyone that's kind of like doing what Boston Beer and Teapot has, has done in terms of showing that like we're holding hands together into this kind of unknown. You also have to think like alcohol is also three tiers in America, right? And that middle tier, that distributor network is one that might be a little bit more proactive. Um, A lot of those guys are distributing these hemp beverages right now and are kind of wetting their beaks as far as the potential for cannabis and whether or not they want to lean into proper cannabis distribution or, or buy some, um, you know, state level cannabis distribution assets. Some of those distributors have business in Canada that they run as kind of sales agents and distributors as well. So I think it's not just the brewers that make drinks, but there's also the distributors and retailers that also could potentially flex and would do what they do in the cannabis sector as well. So yeah, I think big alcohol, which is both brewers, distributors, and retailers, um, all of them are, are going to find one way or another to be market ready. Yeah, I, I think so. I agree. Uh, and I think the report, exactly like you alluded to, is eye opening. And I think for those who have their head in the sand still, maybe have peaked up and realized, hey, this is not only coming, this is something that we need to be preparing for. And, and maybe they won't do it publicly, but I think all of them are taking active efforts in order to make sure that when the time is right, they are ready to act because sure, they can move forward and they can buy companies pretty quick, but you got to know the ones to buy and you got to know the rules of the game that you're playing. And sometimes that involves taking time and efforts ahead of time to be prepared for when those moments happen. Yep. Yeah. Right on. Cool. So Paul, for our listeners, they want to get in touch. They want to try Twisted Tea. Where can they find you? Well, first, if you're in America and you want to try Twisted Tea, just follow us on Instagram. Got a beautiful Instagram account for Twisted Tea. It's basically just jokes. (laughs) It's just like a meme account. Uh, Twist. Just go follow us on Twisted Tea on Instagram, and then you'll you'll start to see what we're up to there. Uh, Go to drinkteapot.com. So drinkteapot.com or at drinkteapot on Instagram. You can find our brand. There's a nice product finder, or you can uh, buy our merch. Awesome. Thanks for taking time. This was a lot of fun. Brian Kellen. Thanks. uh, Thanks for having me. Cheers.